Council, it is 7 p.m. on December the 6th, 2023. I call this meeting to order. Will everyone please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance? Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Okay, up next we have a uh, roll call. Might be missing one. Got it? Okay, good. Ms. All, Mar count oh. All counselors <laughs> present and a quorum has been declared. Okay, thank you. Up next, we have agenda approval. Mayor. Yes. We have a recommendation. We recommend that we move item three, which is the resolution recognizing Mayor Pro Tem Charles Griego to be letter E under ceremonial items. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Sanchez. Okay. All right. Councilor Vigil. Mayor, I move that we approve the agenda as presented, moving uh, Charlie Grego's recognition to num uh, letter E under ceremonial items. I second. Okay. We have a motion and a second. Do we have any further discussion? Not. Right. Please start voting. Ms. Martinez? The motion carried unanimously. Okay. Um, up next, we have citizen comments. This is the segment of the agenda to where um, those of you who have filled out the comment cards, you will be able to come up to the podium. And we do ask that you keep your comments to within three minutes. Uh, Ms. Martinez, if you all don't mind starting the clock so we can make sure we keep track of the time. We, we ask that you uh, keep your comments to within three minutes. If you're still talking at that point in time, I will politely ask you to end um, your conversations uh, at that time. During these um, citizen comments, we don't go back and forth um, and we don't answer questions or have comments, but at the very end, we have what we call council comments to where if any council members would, members would like to make any comments at the end of the meeting, pertaining to any of these conversations, that's when those uh, comments are made. Okay, um, the first one I have is Ovalos, if I'm not, I hope I said the last name right. Is it William Ovalos? Yes. Olivas, okay. If you can come up to the mic, William, I'm so sorry. Here you go. Just speaking to the mic. Okay. Um, for as long as I've known, I've always owned my residence. Supposedly my mom got a loan through a bank or something, I don't know. And the, the bank entrusted the city, I guess, to my mom giving them the property when she passed away or whatever and foreclosed on the house and the city ended up buying my property and I honestly don't know what to do. <laughs> That's all I think. Okay. So I believe on the agenda, there's going to be some discussions about this later on. So you'll, you'll be able to hear some of that conversation at that time. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. Up next, we have uh, Ruthie Brown. Ruthie Brown. Um, so I have a few questions here and I've only got three minutes on so your market set go. 
You know, I see later on this evening, you have a whole whole bunch of reasons for building a motel downtown and all that type of stuff and everything you're gonna do for the Walsh and for Mr. Patel and what have you. But as as a taxpayer, I would I would like to see a little bit more definition on that, like value of the property. And roundabout way, small towns, I have found that someone from the public defender's office goes over to Ruby Slipper, Ruby Slipper people, some talk to me and say, wow, is the parking gonna be like this? Is this gonna be restricted? Is that gonna be restricted? Um, and today reading about how oh, we're going to pay for the digging up of the foundation in the basement, but oh, we'll be paid back because we're going to do the tax thing. And I just don't have any trust for that. So I, I think you owe all of us uh, a little bit more detailed information on what you're, what you're giving away or trading because it's, it's ours. Um, how much is this going to cost other businesses to put another business in business is there going to be a, a bar in that hotel? Is there going to be a restaurant there? I, I think everyone needs to know that. So um, I asked a month or so ago about a, um, a report on the homeless camp, like how many huts are still out there? How many were put in originally? I wonder if any of those huts were ever ADA accessible or was there a Porta John out there that was ADA accessible because I know of someone who lived there for months and months and months, and I'm not positive that that the hut she lived in is uh, uninhabitable. How could the city of Alamosa and La Puente Outreach allow a person to live that way? And I'm not saying this person isn't innocent, but the city and La Puente Outreach allowed it. Um, so anyway, I'd like to see what a report on that. And then the, um, I'd also like to see where we stand with the 600 pages of police calls. Is that public record that anyone in the public can go to the library and check? More than all of this, um, Mayor Coleman, I was, I was sickened, truly sickened when I saw the article that said you were, even before all meetings have been held, were 1000% behind our city manager. And, and where, where you have the right to feel that way, I have the right to, to my opinions also. I believe a comment like that was a total insult to our chief of police. It was a total insult to every law enforcement officer that was here in support of Kenny Anderson, both in uni uniform and out of uniform. Um, seems like we finish having the meetings and, and I was gonna tell you what I'm hearing on the street right now, but I'm not gonna do that tonight. I think it'll come up sooner or later, but um, we're supposed to trust the process and the process was not finished. And then tonight, later on this evening, you're gonna talk about attributes you want in our police chief. Well, all you have to do is write down everything that Kenny Anderson was. It should be a, a real simple thing because we lost a good man we, we kind of just, hey, public, you may know what happened by the end of January, and um, we're supposed to trust that process. Well, I, for one, don't. I think there are problems from what I hear. I mean, I'm kind of surprised they're not a gag order on city employees talking to me because I, I do talk to quite a few or they talk to me or whatever, but the public needs the truth, the whole truth, same as same as this man with his house. He he needs to know. Thank you. Okay, um, Ms. Martinez, those are the only comment cards I have. Um, and uh, we need to go to Zoom to recognize anyone who has their hand up so we can give them an opportunity to make some comments if they would like. 
Yes, sir. If you're on the Zoom app and you want to speak right now, you can use the raise hand feature in the bottom of your screen. If you're on a telephone, you'll dial star nine. And Mayor, I don't see anyone raising their hand. Okay, so I'll turn it back over to uh, staff for follow up. Um, thank you, Mayor. To answer a few of the, the questions that were brought up, you are correct. We do have an item on the agenda um, related to the purchase of that home and for council to have that discussion. So I encourage you to, to stick around for that. Um, and a few of the questions that Ms. Brown brought up, she was asking about how many huts we have and, and, and those questions. We started with a grant that paid for 15 huts. Um, the understanding was going into that grant that this was not something the city was going to maintain, that if the huts, something happens to them, then, then they're gone. Um, last year we had two fires, so that dropped it down to 13. This past year, we had a hut where an individual, it was a bit of a hoarding situation as well as a public health issue of um, being used as a restroom. And so that worked its way through the municipal court. Um, and what we've discovered working with the outreach with, with this population and tracking the engagement of those who are in the huts compared to those who are not in the huts is the huts are actually not working the way we intended them to work. Um, and what we have noticed is those who are not in the huts are much more likely to engage with, with outreach and the co-responders to, to start working on engaging with existing resources, working their way to try to get a job or get into housing and those types of things. Those who were in the huts were dramatically less likely to do that. So it was actually having the opposite impact um, of what they were intended. Additionally, the idea was that if you can lock them, people can lock their belongings in there, go to the job, those types of things. So a little bit of a stepping stone. Um, it turns out, you know, picking a lock is, I guess, fairly easy. And so th that wasn't making any difference either. And so back to then this third hut that um, was in pretty bad shape, once it worked its way through municipal court, rather than um, paying to have someone to try to go in there and clean that up, we just disposed of it. And that's gonna be the plan going forward is if any of the huts reach their end of life, they're going to be disposed of. And, and that way, um, the engagement with services and the motivation to try to work on things will, will be what we feel is needed um, from an engagement perspective. So in regards to the huts, to my knowledge, I'm not sure if they were ADA or not. They didn't have anything in them. It was just a big box, but I don't know if that was if there's a step to get into it. Thankfully, I know the individual that um, we had that was in a wheelchair has, um, thanks to our co-responders, found herself in a home. So um, that situation has been addressed. In regards to the impact from the downtown hotel, when we negotiated with Mr. Patel, obviously council was very aware of the need to maintain parking, which is why the um, development agreement includes that he will pave the parking lot across the street where the pink elephant is. And um, to help with that, the new taxes that the hotel will pay will be used to reimburse for that expense, but it will be city property and it will be public parking. The um, difference in the value of property is a, about $4,000 less than um, what the previous agreement was, where the city was going to reimburse um, funding from sales tax. And so it's about, it's on par with the previous development agreement that we had. So just shy of 300,000 is the difference in the estimated property. In regards to why council was interested in this, it's two reasons. One is the economic impact and two is the location. This isn't a hotel on the west side of town where they're more likely to shop at some of the chains eat at some of the chains. This is in the downtown where most of our mom and pop star stores are located. So there's a direct economic impact into um, our smaller businesses. 
and that economic impact is estimated for the first year when you factor in some construction and if they hire a certain percentage locally and, and those types of things. The direct impact is 21.9 million with an estimated when you factor in the multipliers of 39 million. So that's just the first year. Following that, because you take out construction, we estimate that ec the hotel will have an economic impact of 11.9 million each year. And with multipliers, that's 20 million. So those are individuals that we would see eating and shopping in our downtown um, when they come in and stay in the hotel. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms. Sanchez. That brings us to the next item on the agenda. Uh, we have a proclamation, uh, and the proclamation is the recognition of the TSC uh, Men's Cross Country National Champions. Um, tonight, we're going to have our Mayor Pro Tem um, Griego read the proclamation. This is his last city council meeting after 40 years of being on council, and I just wanted to give him the honor of reading this proclamation. And then if we can have um, a couple of the representatives from uh, TSC to come up to the podium and, and we're gonna read the proclamation, then we're gonna come down there and take a picture with the team, okay? All righty. Okay, thank you, Mayor, and you will. Thank you for the honor. <clears throat> the City of Alamosa proclamation in recognition of Trinidad State College men's cross country team. Whereas the NJCAA National Championship was held in Huntsville, Alabama on Saturday, November 11th, 2023. And whereas the Trinidad State College men's cross country team was victorious at the 2023 NJCAA National Championship. And whereas the, the Trojans stellar performers marked a historical achievement for the team securing the first ever NCAA championship in cross country. And whereas coach Lauren Matson, Matson, and forgive me if I, I don't want to chop up some of these names, but my strategy was evident as the Trojans asserted themselves as the aggressors from the start of the gun. And whereas, whereas there were a total of 16 Six team members who placed at the meeting, including Kiddish Miss, Miss Gina, Hannibal Haley, Cameron Estas, Estace, Vincent Kip, Chip. I'm, so, I'm sorry. <laughs> They've I, got hard names. Okay. <laughs> Aya Sadi, Kyle Atwell Legay. How about we do this? Um, how about coaches? You name out your team. Yeah, how, how about you do that? Okay. Yeah, because I'm chopping these names up. No time. race. Okay. They're, they're not necessarily easy. Uh, Kittis Mesquina, Hannibal Haile, Cameron Eustace, Vincent Kipchirchir, Ayub Saeed, Kyle Abulagti, and Daniel Recio. And uh, those were the guys who represented us there, kind of your starters in cross country. Um, additional team members here are Colin Moore, uh, Gavin Gishy and Max Voorhees. Thank you, Coach, thank you so much. Thank you. Whereas the community of Alamosa takes great pride in the accomplishments of this team and wish to congratulate the Trinidad State College men's cross country team. Now I therefore, I, Ty Coleman, virtue of the authority vested in me as mayor of the city of Alamosa and on behalf of the entire city council, do hereby recognize and congratulate Trinidad State College men's cross country team for their accomplishment and their victory as the NJCAA National Champions. Given under my hand, the seal of the city of Alamosa, Colorado on the sixth day of December, 2023. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Coaches, did you want to say anything? Do you want to say anything before we go take a picture? Do you want to say anything before we go down and take a picture? I, I don't think I need to say anything. We just thank you very much. Uh, all credit to these young men over here. Thank you. Hey, thank you. Thank you and congratulations. Oh yeah, Councilor Hensley. Uh, we're gonna let some of the council members go ahead and say a few things. Councilor Hensley. I just wanna congratulate you. I have watched 
um, Trinidad, uh, the cross country team grow from day one and uh, just the amount of work that has gone into it to uh, make such a uh, fantastic team. And I know this is just the start of many more years of success. Thank you. And I want to just say thank you to all of you and thank you for representing our city. Um, and I wish you much success. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Oh, you're right. There's a lot of food in there, guys. Thank you very much, Mayor Pro Tem Griego, for reading that proclamation. We really appreciate it. We're going to move on down uh, ceremonial items, the presentation of the CML University Graduate Level Award uh, will be presented tonight by Ms. Martinez, Ms. Martinez uh, to uh, Councillor Daniel. All right. Sorry. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so this award is going to Councillor Daniel. Um, so I'm going to read the little letter from CML from Kevin Bomber. Um, so he says, Dear Christina, he crossed out Councillor Daniel and said Christina. So on behalf of the Colorado Municipal League, I want to extend our warmest congratulations to you for your remarkable achievement and the university program. Your attainment of the graduate level in the program, an impressive 100 credits, is a testament to your unwavering commitment to the betterment of Alamosa and its residents. The university program initiated by the CML aims to recognize and celebrate municipal elected officials who invest their time and resources in educational events to enhance their knowledge of effective local governance. Your leadership and dedication have set a remarkable example for others to follow. Your dedication to municipal government and your exceptional commitment to the city of Alamosa have not gone unnoticed. We at the Colorado Municipal League have been proud to have you as a member and recognize your outstanding contributions to municipal governance. You also have my undying gratitude for your support of CML and the principles of good governance. We encourage your colleagues and community to join us in recognizing and applauding your exceptional contributions to the city. Please do stay in touch. Best regards, Kevin Bummer, CML Director. Awesome. And then I just want to mention, like, so Christina, the last time I mentioned the CML University credits, she was at 99, and she went out and she got that one credit she needed, like, right away. So right. congratulations to Christina Daniel. And congratulations, Councilor Daniel. Councilor Daniel, congratulations. Did and you I, want to say anything? We have your mom. So it was really important for me to not leave with just one credit <laughs> left. That, that would have been, like, terrible in my mind. So I'm super excited that that happened. So thank you, team. And we do, they did send a plaque, so I'll come give you your plaque. <laughs> All 
Awesome. Great job, way to finish it up. Good job, good job. All right, so that brings us to the next item on the agenda, uh, recognition of our retiring council members, and that's gonna be presented by Ms. Martinez as well. Okay, so tonight we have two counselors retiring. We have Counselor Daniel, and she has served eight years on city council. And then we have Counselor or Mayor Pro Tem Griego, who has served 40 years. Um, so we do have a couple plaques for you. Um, so I'll have Chris, Counselor Daniel come down first and I'll give you your plaque. Um, I might get you come up and we'll have this. So the plaque we have gotten you is in recognition and appreciation of your many years of dedicated service, devotion, and commitment to the Alamosa City Council. We present this award to you. And we did list your mayor pro tem, counselor at large, and ward two. So you are. Mayor, do you want people to talk right now? Sure. Or? What we what we can do is we'll do uh we'll have everyone talk for uh, Councilor Daniel, and then we'll do the same thing for Councilor Griego. Okay. And That'll counselors, work. what we'll do is we'll start down here at this end with uh, Councilor Hensley, and we'll work our way all the way down to the end, and I'll wrap things up. Um, okay. All right. Go ahead. So, Councilor Daniel, you and I have known each other for a long, long time, and I've always valued. Um, your thought process, your time that you take to listen and really um, go into every situation with a true idea of I'm going to listen to all sides and really make a decision from there. I've learned a lot from you. I've also learned a lot from the empathy you bring into the situation um, and tying that into all the decisions you make. And I just want you to know that you've really made a difference in my life and all the things that you do. Councilor Carson. Liz stole everything I was gonna say. <laughs> um, Christina, thank you for your time serving this community and working with me and putting up with me and haggling with me. I know that, uh, I know we don't always see eye to eye, but uh, I, I think we've kicked some butt together on council. We've done a good job. and. Um, Let's see if you don't get bored and run again in a couple of years. Um, Godspeed on the new journey and uh, Godspeed with Kevin and, and having to, to deal with some of the stuff that he's going to be dealing with on Wednesday nights. Now, you know, you guys get to do fun stuff, but uh, thank you. Um, the city's losing a, a big asset in you. You, you are, you're an exceptional counselor. So thank you. And, and I appreciate what I've learned from you as well. Thank you. Councilor Griego. Christina, I've worked with a lot of counselors, but what you bring to the council is your heart and everything that you, when you talk about something or you're, you're dealing with something, you can tell it comes from your heart and how you, how you portray it and stuff. I, like I said, I have enjoyed working with you and, and hopefully that we'll maybe eventually work together sometime somewhere else, but you, have done a great service to this community, you know, and what uh, your dedication and stuff. And I don't see how yourself and even Liz, how, you know, the, the 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 amount of work that you guys have and still able to perform the, the duties of city council. Thank you so much, Christina. Thank you, Councilor Grego. Councilor Cribs. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I've already said some things to Councilor Daniel, but. I, I want to thank you when I was first appointed to the board. One of my fondest memories is I sat in this chair for the very first time and she was sitting next to me and she goes, don't worry, you've got this. And she did everything she could to make me feel comfortable and to make my uh, words and my presence feel valued. And for that, I thank you. Um, it was so enjoyable 
to be able to work with this side of you because I see so many other sides of you. And so I, I just, I look forward to what the city can expect from you moving forward. So it's gonna be fun to watch. Thank you, Council Cripps. Ms. Daniel, it's been an honor to serve with you for the last eight years. I remember before council uh, playing cards with you in poker club at Adam State and you and Kevin. And uh, uh, when I think of you, and your contributions, I think of uh, Liz stole this word empathy, your work on mental health, your work on uh, behavioral health and, and opening our eyes to that, a lot of that stuff. That is so huge, especially over the last few years coming out of COVID. Um, I think of your work and your spearheading the uh, call responder program. You've done a lot, Christina. You've done a lot up here. And uh, we're going to miss that, that piece. We're, that's a void that we're going to have, and it's going to be hard for us to fill it, but thank you so much. Thank you, Councillor Vijo. Councillor Daniel, Mayor Pro Tem Daniel as well. Um, you are truly going to be missed. I tell you, when I think of you, I think of reliable, dependable, courageous, and kind-hearted. That's you, and there are so many other words I could use to describe you, but we're gonna miss your professionalism that you bring to this council, your open-mindedness that, that's needed in, in, in times of challenging uh, issues. Uh, I wanna thank you for all the time, effort, commitment, and dedication that you've shared here on council. And we wish you the very best in all your future endeavors, and we're quite sure that you have a lot of uh, bright things coming ahead for you. So thank you so very much. Mayor, is it okay if I yes, say it? Sure, okay. please go ahead. Um, I just wanted to say thank you to all of you. Um, it has been an honor and a pleasure serving with, with you all. And, you know, Michael Stefano and, you know, the, I think about all the people Charlie served with and I think I, I've had very much less of that. And I just wanted to say how much I have appreciated the willingness for all of us to grow and learn together. Um, I have appreciated the, the time, the kindness and the energy you all have brought to our community. Um, I wanna say a special thank you to all the staff. Um, I feel like you all have done such an amazing job in the work that you do and with the, the people we all serve together and the abilities and the things you've brought to this community that we sometimes get credit for, <laughs> um, truthfully. Um, and so I just really wanna say the work that you all do is very much appreciated and very, very valuable. And we wouldn't be the city we are without the things that you all bring to the table. And it just is our fortune and our luck, I think, as elected officials that we get to work with you all. So thank you for the work that you do. And I have really appreciated the time I've been able to serve on council. Um, I've been thinking about it. I'm kind of excited that I didn't have to run again. I've run three times, like lost once. Like there's been a lot that's happened in these eight years. Um, and so I'm, I'm really, I'm really grateful for the experiences that I've had and the leadership that I've learned from all of you. So thank you very much for this time and this this honor that I've been able to, to share with you. So thank you. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Martinez. Hey, um, so next up, we have Mayor Pro Tem Griego. And he's served us for 40 years. So he didn't make it to his reception. It went really well and had great attendance. So, but we did present his plaque earlier, but I want to present it again now in the meeting and read it to everybody. So Char Charlie made sure he got what he wanted um, for his plaque. So um, it's it's really nice. And I hope he like, keeps it and holds it forever, but uh, Mayor Charles Gray presented to Charles Griego, Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you for the 40 years you have served as a city councilman representing the third ward of the city of Alamosa. Your presence has helped shape Alamosa into the city it has become today, 1983 to 2023. 
and the plaque does include the key to the city. So <laughs> when you get when you're at 40 years, you get that. <laughs> Okay, we're gonna start at the end with Councilor Daniel and go our way down to this end and I'll wrap things up. Go ahead, Councilor Daniel. Thank you. Um, Councilor Griego, it has been more than an honor to work with you um, and to be and to see your leadership even from before what before I was on council. I've appreciated all of the things that you bring to light for us to communicate about and to talk through um, and the way that you have shared your ideas and experience with us. Um, I think the context you bring to our decisions is, has been so important and so valuable. And I personally have valued our conversations and our learning together and the, the time we have spent. And so I just really appreciate it. And thank you so much for the time and commitment you've given to the city. It is, it's done so many things for us as a community and I really appreciate it. Hey, Councilor Hanson. Charlie, I remember when I first got elected, um, you reached out to me, I remember said, let's have a cup of coffee, um, truly made me feel comfortable, um, reassured me, said, hey, you know, reminding me that it's really important to go in open-minded, to listen, things like that. The other thing I've really learned from you, um, there's many, but two things that really stand out. One is that we haven't always agreed on everything, but what I've really respected is we'll be up here, we'll talk about things, and then we'll move on to the next topic and we're united again. And, and always, even if we agree to disagree, it's coming from the right. Um, we both come into it with our hearts and what we want best for the city. And we both know that's where that's going. So that's, I've always valued. And I learned that from you. The other thing is your voice and that idea of remembering no matter what ward we represent or for at large, that the city of Alamosa is very diverse, has many different um, people, many different situations, all of that. And your voice always speaking for Ward 3 and reminding us and reminding us all to also represent our wards the way we should. And so I just want to thank you for that as well. Charlie, uh, I know I got choked up earlier talking to you. Um, it was hard because uh, since I joined the Knights, you've always been a mentor and, and a good brother to me. Um, I appreciate what you've taught me uh, and the example you've set in serving our, our community. And uh, I hope I can do half that. Thank you. Thank you, Nate. Thank you, Councilor. Um, Councilor similar to Christina, I've already said my words to Charlie privately, but thank you for showing me that you can lead with kindness and with your heart and with your values strong and this community is better for it. And it shows me that that's the way to lead. So thank you. I'm not gonna cry like uh, about an hour ago, but um, just uh, Charlie, your your passion for, for War Three and re representing those who are kind of shunned by society or in poverty and you're a champion of those folks. And I just really have appreciated that over the last eight years. Uh, like I said earlier, uh, Charlie, um, you've become like a father figure to me. And I really appreciate that. Um, you and Janice have taken my family under your wing. You've made us feel welcome here. And uh, uh, I'm still gonna call you every morning about 9 a.m. <laughs> To talk about nothing and yeah. uh, but uh, right on man thank you thank you thank you yeah. mayor pro tim brago i'll wrap things up um a lot of you probably don't know this but i, I wouldn't be on council if it wasn't for um mayor pro tim griego and 
uh, Mayor Kathy Woods and uh, Rusty Johnson back in the day. Um, they encouraged me to run and um, I did not want to, but they did. And um, I'm really thankful for that. I remember when I first got on council one time, uh, Councilor Griego and I had a disagreement and I made the mistake of telling him, I think you missed the boat on this issue, Mr. Mayor, Mayor uh, Griego, I mean, Mayor Pro Tem Griego. <laughs> And he was furious. I mean, he had, he was hot. I I never seen him get so red before. And he he didn't he didn't say anything or discipline me right then on the, on the podium or anything. So he told me he says I want to have a meeting with you. So we had a meeting and he wanted me to meet him at a restaurant. So we go to the restaurant over there and he said and then general public he says oh no we're not meeting right here we're going to the back of the restaurant. <laughs> I was like, whoa, man, what did I do? And so he 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 said, How dare you say I missed the boat on this issue? He says, Coleman, I've never even been on a boat. <laughs> <laughs> but what he told me, and I learned from this, he says, I was so furious, I was so frustrated, but this is what I learned. And this is what you need to learn, uh, Coleman. He said, We can have disagreements when we're at council but we don't take that outside of council. Find a way to be respectful and thoughtful with your colleagues. And I learned from that uh, mistake and I'm really thankful for you. So Mayor Pro Tem Griego, when I think about words uh, to sum up some of the things about you, you are a voice for the voiceless. All of us up here know that you always speak up for those who are not able to speak up for themselves. And you're also historic. Not only do I think you broke just about every record by being here for 40 years, but you have been our historian. When we needed to go back to figure out why something was done so many years ago, you gave us guidance. You was that beacon of hope or light going back into history to help us make it through those tough and challenging times. And I just want to thank you for everything that you've done and thank you and your wife for all your support for all these years and may God continue to bless you and everything that you do, my friend. Thank you, Mayor. You're welcome. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you guys for all the great comments. You know, to do this job, it's not one person. It's all these people. It's that city manager, it's all that staff out there that the city manager puts together. And we work as a team. And, I, if you, and if you can't work as a team, you shouldn't be in a position like this because this is how things get done. And we're, you're right, we disagree, you know? And sometimes the, the disagreement, I would go home and I said, well, why did Liz disagree on this? And then I would think about it and think about it and then come back and find a way how to, how to work with it and stuff. But it's been, it, I've had an opportunity to work with a lot of people, you know, a lot of counselors, a lot of staff, you know, and I, you know, I, I support all my staff, my chief of police, and I support our city manager. You know, there's the toughest part of this whole deal is that lady takes a lot of beef for us, okay? We give direction. She has to get, to put it out there and force it, and sometimes it it's it's not taken well. But we are the ones that should be getting beat up, and it's not fair. But I, she's tough, you know. I, I was the one who hired her, one of them, and I knew from that day that we were going to do great things and bring in great council people and stuff and young people to 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 do what we do, you know. So. It's been a great deal. It's I, you know, forty years. It sounds like a lot, but it seems it's it's gone pretty fast, you know. And, and I enjoyed it, with, you know. So thank you, everybody. So, yeah. Thank you. Hey. So um, I think this is the part to where um, Mayor Pro Tem Daniel and Mayor Pro Tem Riego are going to take their step down off of the podium. And once again, let's give them all a round of applause.
Okay, so now um, we are going to have the oath of office for our new council members and returning council members, which is going to be um, headed by Ms. Martinez. Okay, so we are going to swear in our new counselors. So everyone that was that ran for election this year will need to come down. Um, we're going to start with Michael Carson for the at large position. So if you can raise your right hand and repeat after me. Uh, this is your oath of office. So I, Michael Carson. I, Michael Carson. Subject to the penalties of perjury. Subject to the penalties of perjury. Solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will support and uphold. That I will support and uphold. The Constitution of the United States. The Constitution and laws of the United States. Of the state of Colorado. And of the state of Colorado. And the charter and ordinances of Alamosa. And the charter and ordinances of the city of Alamosa. And faithfully perform the duties of counselor at large, which I, am about to undertake. which I am about to undertake. Thank you. And Counselor Carson has been elected for a four year term. Okay, next we have our new counselor, Jackie V. Hill. Right hand and repeat after me. Hi, Jackie V. Hill. Hi, Jackie V. Hill. Subject to the penalties and perjury. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will support and uphold. That I will support and uphold. The Constitution and laws. The Constitution and laws. Of the United States and the State of Colorado. Of the United States and the State of Colorado. And the Charter and Ordinances. And the Charter and Ordinances. Of the City of Alamosa. Of the City of Alamosa. And faithfully perform. And faithfully perform. The duties of Counselor Ward Three. The duties of Counselor Ward Three which I am about to undertake. And Councillor Vigil, you have been elected to a four-year term. <laughs> yes, you are welcome up there. All right, next we have Councillor Don Cripps. You can raise your right hand and repeat after me. I, Don Krebs, subject to the penalties of perjury, do solemnly swear that will I, I will support and uphold the Constitution and laws of the United States and of the state of Colorado and the charter and ordinances of the city of Alamosa and faithfully perform the duties of Counselor Ward 2, which I am about to undertake. 
You're welcome. And oh, just a second. So here's your certificate of election. You have been elected for a two year term. Okay. And last but not least, Councillor Hensley. Oh, you're already here. You're fast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Raise your right hand. I, Liz Hensley, subject to the penalties of perjury, do solemnly swear that I will support and uphold the Constitution and laws of the United States and of the state of Colorado and the charter and ordinances of the city of Alamosa and faithfully perform the duties of Councilor Ward 1 which I'm about to undertake. Thank you. Also, I forget you to sign. Oh, up here. <laughs> Perfect. And then here is your certificate of election. You've been elected for a four-year term. So what I'm going to do, I know this is a special honor for everyone who uh, was elected. I am going to allow you all the opportunity to say a few words to, uh, if you would like at this time, because um, I know some of you have family and friends uh, here and we're just gonna give you that opportunity, okay? So if you would turn your mics on um, and if you wanna say something, I'll recognize you. Um. I just want to thank everybody of the city of Alamosa, especially Ward 3, um, for voting for me and believing in um, what I want to accomplish. And I also want to thank Charlie Grego, because like I said earlier, I'm going to have some big shoes to fill. Okay, thank you. Okay, that's going to bring us to Councillor uh, Hensley, then uh, Krebs, then Carson. So I also, I'd like to thank all those in Ward 1 who uh, continue to support me. I always try to advocate uh, for those in my area. Um, like anything though, I'm always learning and growing and trying to become better. I'm never stagnant in what I do. And every week when I come here, as new things happen, it opens my eyes and I will continue to grow, learn and listen. Okay, thank you, Councilor Hensley, Councilor Krebs and Councilor Carson. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I want to thank everyone who voted for me in Ward 2 and showed their, their support of me. It is appreciated. Um, I hope to keep doing very many things. I've only been a counselor for the short time, so I've been learning, and I feel I have a lot more to learn, and so I want to thank you for the opportunity, and um, I want to thank you for the support from my family through this because... It's it's a group effort, trust me. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Carson. Um, uh, I too would just like to thank everybody that uh, showed confidence in what I've done and uh, for supporting me. And, and um, I would like to thank the, the entire city. I'd like to thank everybody on council and everybody at staff. Um, you know, we hit some, we have hit some rough patches. We have our ups and downs. And like Char, uh, Councilor Grego said, we, we would disagree. Uh, we always found a way through it. And um, we I appreciate that we're all respectful and professional. And um, let's just keep fighting the good fight, everybody. And welcome to the to brand new counselor. And uh, we look forward to working with you. And yes, you do have some big shoes to fill. Charlie's, Charlie's a bad dude. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you, guys. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you all and welcome to our team. And we like to use acronym for team, T-E-A-M stands for together, everyone achieves more. So we're looking forward to achieving a lot together. And that's gonna bring us to item we moved up on the agenda, am I right, Ms. Martinez? Uh, are you gonna take that? On? Yes, yes, okay. sir, you are. Okay, mm -hmm. that's gonna be the resolution number 18-2023, uh, recognizing an appreciation of the distinguished service uh, by Mayor Pro Tem, Charlie Griego. Yes, sir. Um, so for this resolution, so in your council policy, you guys have the recognition guidelines for individuals stating that yeah. a resolution of congratulations or com commendation may be used to recognize outgoing elected and appointed city officials who've made outstanding contributions to the city of Alamosa. So we have done that because Mayor Pro Tem Griego served on Alamosa City Council for just over 40 years, um, which is a significant amount of time. So I'm just gonna read the resolution. I know we normally don't, but a resolution in recognition and appreciation of distinguished service by Mayor Pro Tem Charles Griego, whereas in recognition of Mayor Pro Tem Charles Griego's announcement and retirement, the city of Alamosa wants to extend their utmost gratitude for his service. And whereas Mayor Pro Tem Griego was first elected and sworn in on November 16th, 1983. And whereas Mayor Pro Tem Griego has always been mindful of the interests of the constituents of Ward 3 and has worked tirelessly to advance the city of Alamosa. And whereas Mayor Pro Tem Griego has provided outstanding leadership and guidance to the city, Alamosa City Council. And whereas Mayor Pro Tem Griego faithfully and with honor, integrity, and great distinction served as councilman for Ward 3 of the city of Alamosa for over 40 years. And whereas during the course of these 40 years, Councilor Griego served as Mayor Pro Tem 17 out of the 40 years, most recently as Mayor Pro Tem for 2023. Now, therefore, be it here be it hereby resolved the City Council of the, Alam the City of Alamosa, Colorado, that the City of Alamosa formally acknowledges and extends its profound gratitude and appreciation to Charles Griego for his 40 years of faithful and dedicated service to the City Council of the City of Alamosa, the constituents of Ward 3, and the entire community of Alamosa. Further, we call upon the residents of the City of Alamosa to recognize the contribution and service that Charles Griego has brought to the community and extend our serious our sincerest congratulations on his retirement. Approved, passed, and adopted the sixth day of December, 2023. So, Ms. Martinez, we do need to vote on this, don't we? Yes, okay. it needs to be a motion because it's an official record. Thank you so very much. Councilor Vigil. It's my honor to move that we Pass resolution number 18, 2023, a resolution in recognition and appreciation of distinguished service by Mayor Pro Tem Charles Griego. And it's my honor to second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Do we have any further discussion? If not, please start voting. Ms. Martinez? The motion carried unanimously. Thank you, and thank you again, Mayor Pro Tem Griego. Thank you, thank you once again. Uh, boy, the city really does a, a show. Don't, when you're going out, you did a great job. You know, like I said, it, it it takes a team, and we'll be here supporting you. You know, there's there. When the tough issues come around, you'll hear us in the background, but we'll be there to support you because I know the hard work that you guys do and the staff does, you know, and sometimes some people don't really get the clear picture out there. And it's our job to go out there and, and explain it to them and tell them that, you know, because th there's a lot of misinterpretation out there. And it's our job to go out there and and, and listen to the people and, and work with them and treat everybody equal and, and, and fair, you know, and it's, it's something that you guys have all done and I'm sure you'll continue doing. So thank you very much. And it's going to be hard to, you know, reality is finally starting to hit, you know, that you're, that I'm leaving. So, but it, it's been a, it's been a good, a good time and 40 years went by pretty fast. So thank you very much. Thank you.
Okay, that brings us to the next item on the agenda, consent calendar A. Councilor Vigil. Yep. Mayor, I move that we approve consent calendar A. I'll second. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? If not, please start voting. Thank you. Ms. Martinez? The motion carried unanimously. That brings us to the next item on the agenda. Business brought forward by city staff, development services. Good evening, council. Good evening. Good evening, Councillor V. Hill and Councillor V. Hill. <laughs> um, Ms. Martinez, I believe you have a presentation. She's loading it up right now. I always have to start with a joke or something to make you laugh. Okay, so um, for those of you, we've had a lot of things happen since we went through this works session. So one of the things, uh, go ahead and go to the next slide, please, um, that we've been keeping our eyes on is, are we over parked, especially in apartment style developments? That's kind of the core question. And so to, um, to really suss that out, um, go ahead, Ms. Holland. Um, well, first of all, why would we want to maybe solve a, a problem if we have too much parking? It's expensive to build and maintain. It wastes real estate. You have uh, potential nuisances that are involved. Um, also increased stormwater runoff. So there's some reasons we want to explore the idea. And it's really important to acknowledge that we're not trying to limit, uh, you know, we're not trying to create any sort of um, parking shortage. We just want to limit the oversupply. And so how did we do this? Um, again, Biata deserves abundant amount of credit. She's our um, our development uh, planning and development technician. Um, so she did manual counts at 24 different apartment complexes um, at uh, the morning. So about eight o'clock in the morning on a weekday, about eight o'clock in the evening on a weekday, and then Sunday evening. So that that really uh, is intended to give us a pretty good snapshot. And um, so really what we found is, um, oh, let me back up really quick. One of the things we uh, were looking at is how many parking spaces are on site, how many does our code currently require, and then how much of that is actually being used and what is that maximum amount. And then we also looked at market rate apartments versus low income. We also looked at senior, uh, senior apartments as well. And so this is what we found, and I'm putting a couple of asterisks here because um, as Councillor Hensley had brought up during the work session, um, you know, based on our observations, we only found three apartment complexes that were under parked. So as in they had spillover to where they were parking on the adjacent streets. Um, what we didn't observe was the Sage Apartments having a, a shortage, but obviously when those counts uh, were taken would have um, certainly have a, an impact. But, and I think this really kind of uh, demonstrates the point that um, with those specific apartments, they didn't actually have the minimum required. So we would almost expect there to be a shortage um, that uh, Councillor Hensley had observed. So really what we saw is that the actual parking on the ground tended to be about 187% of the peak demand and so um, for low income housing. So essentially there's almost twice as much parking as you need for low income housing. And for market rate, it's about 130%. So when we look at how much the code requires, so if you were to build a new apartment complex, it would require two and a half times more for a low income apartment than what would actually be used. And then for market rate, again, you know, our code is requiring 75% more than really what would be we would expect to be necessary. So when we, you know, put together that crazy spreadsheet, um, you know, we came up with a couple of sort of breakdowns. So on the left in the orange, that's what our code currently requires. So um, 
you know, based on zero or one bedroom. So if like a studio, two bedroom or three or more, they require one and a half, two or three parking spaces. So what we're proposing is breaking that out into three separate categories. The, the goal is to, you know, get that kind of average of 125% of our peak observed demand. So really we didn't want any of those that we observed to be below that 125%. So essentially across the board, we'd reduce it into that, um, that blue column. And then there would be an additional uh, tier for either senior housing or low income, which would have a further reduction. And then in apartments where you have both senior and low income, then there's a further reduction because there is some sort of a relationship between vehicle ownership and household income and also age. So uh, this is what has been presented in the ordinance um, for recommendation. One other thing that um, you know we we observed and, and we you know added into this was essentially a a swap for bicycle racks versus spaces. So uh, with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Councillor Hensley. Um, you may not know this, so I'm just curious. So now that you've researched and that Sage was under. Um, didn't have enough parking. Do you know by what level I does it meet that slide that had the criteria of two and a half per, or was it even lower? So it was even lower than that. So um, I do need to do some digging why the amount of counted spaces um, are less than what the code requires. Um, I haven't really figured that that part out yet. So um, it might have been kind of a timing of when certain buildings were built. Um, or what older codes required back then. So I'm not 100% sure. So going forward, any additional, uh, so since that, and so you do think that is below the two, two and a half, or like if it was th a three bedroom and all of those, that criteria. So it's already below that anyway. Correct. Yeah, so uh, for maybe to take your example one step further, if if there was room to put another apartment there, um, they would have to meet the 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 sum total of, you know, what that net demand would be, so. Okay, Councilor Cribs. Um, Just a clarification. So with this ordinance, it would be for developments um, yet to be built. We wouldn't be retrofitting parking spaces. That's correct. Thank the you. only caveat is if they make a substantial change, then the new code can, um, be in effect. And so if they make a substantial change, they could take advantage of reducing some of the parking. Thank you. Okay. No other uh, comments. Okay. Cal. Sorry. Uh, are you guys, or have, since you're working through this, have you come up with a map of where those changes will hit? And if so, can you, can we get that this week or something to look at? Sure. Um, so the changes wouldn't necessarily hit anything that's currently in existence, but it would be, you know, sort of across the board, no matter where they, they would be adopted. So no matter where a, an apartment complex would be built, it would fall under these new rules. This is only going to affect apartment complexes? Correct. Except for the bicycle swap. So I guess, oh, I'm sorry. No, you're good. So another question I have then is the Boyd construction. Um, so I would assume that would be something where that would affect them. That's a great example of where this would come into place. And which which area on that would it fall under? So I don't have all of their, their specific unit breakdowns. So certainly they would fall at least under the, the middle tier of the low income, but I don't know if they have any um, additional that are mobility restricted and low income, and I think they would. So it might be a little bit of a mix and match. So if they have two... Um, one bedroom units that are low income and mobility and restricted, they would have that lowest tier for just those two units. And then the other ones would fall under the middle. So tier. when you say mobility restricted, are you saying that because it has ADA compliant? So in general, um, we kind of struggled with a concise definition. So essentially, um, and I, I, I'm failing to remember the exact wording that we used in the ordinance, but um, it's essentially anyone that uh, uh, caters to a population 62 years or older or due to um, a physical, mental, or behavioral um, sort of uh, constraint that they're, they're constrained to use, you know, am something about ambulatory movements. So I'm really trying not to top my head, but essentially it's someone who we don't expect to be able to move, you know, freely in, in general. 
Okay, because I do know housing coalition and stuff, almost everything now they would build would be ADA with that idea of the potential. So I guess I just want to be careful because I, I look at certain areas that parking off that is going to be tough in that area. And so I guess just something to really, I would hate to err to being overly like that, oh, someday we may work with that extreme population. So we're going to even limit the parking even more. So just something. I'm, I'm really glad you brought that up. One of the restrictions. So if, if one were to take advantage of those different reduced rates, um, they have to enter into a deed restriction that essentially says, if, if you are, you know, we're essentially locking you in that if you are going to take advantage of this, you have to rent to this. Okay. So um, thank you for, for okay. asking that. Well, that helps. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Councillor Jan V. Hill. Yeah. <laughs> That's good, man. <laughs> Mayor, I move that we approve on first reading and set for a second, uh, a public hearing, for second reading and public hearing, ordinance number 21-2023 on December 20th at 7 p.m. or soon thereafter. I'll second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? If not, please start voting. Ms. Martinez? The motion carried unanimously. Okay. Thank, thank you, you all. Thank you very much. That brings us to the next item on the agenda under uh, public works. I believe um, we have Harry coming up to the, Mr. Reynolds, coming up to the podium. Good evening, Council. Mr. Mayor? Good evening. Good thing is I'm not asking for more money tonight, but <laughs> what, I, what I'd like to request is council consider allowing us to reallocate some funding that we have designated in our street maintenance uh, budget. We have $25,000 left this year to um, apply to the street purchase or purchase the materials for street repair. And um, most of that would be going towards a cold mix uh, asphalt mix. What we're looking at doing and what we've been um, demoing is it's a basically it's a small asphalt plant. It's a little mobile plant that goes on the back of a bumper of a truck. And what I what I'm requesting is that we use the remaining twenty five thousand we have in the budget in 2023 and the remaining um, thirty nine thousand. Uh, let me see thirty nine thousand one hundred ninety five dollars um, in the 2024 budget to pay for this unit. What the the benefit of this. Um, asphalt recycler, recycler unit is, is it allows us to be able to do hot patches year round. Currently what we do is we, we send a truck in the springtime to go get oil out of Denver, uh, kind of a bulk oil, and then we, we mix it with like chips, rock chips, and, and we use that in a, what we call the sh uh, shoulder seasons um, when our main plant ACI isn't running. And so the, the, the patches aren't, they're not very stable. They're very susceptible to weather they break down and this unit would allow us to make permanent patches year round, allow us to, um, if we have an emergency in the winter time, make a good patch instead of ones that continually break down. So my uh, request is council consider this and uh, provide further direction. Okay, Councilor Yadvi Hill and then Councilor Hensley. I'm ready to make a motion that this is gonna help our crew out. I have a quick question. Go ahead. Question. My question just is, is, and I don't need to get into the weeds, but what makes the difference between having this versus the hot patches or whatever the term was you were using that aren't as good? If you don't mind, just why is that different? So there's two different products that we use in the solar season. One is the what our pothole machine repair machine that we have currently, and that's an oil-based material with chip seal. We get a bag mix that, that we use when that oil is not available. Um, it's the binder in the oil that just doesn't hold up. So it breaks down, um, it's brittle when it gets cold and as, as it gets beat up on the roads, it just breaks down quicker where the, the hot asphalt is really what we're doing is we're recycling asphalt that we're pulling from the streets. We crush it, we put a rejuvenator in it and it's really the same as what we'd get from ACI. So it's a long-term fix versus just a temporary fix. Councilor Carson, then Councilor uh, Cripps. Uh, I just have one quick question and don't, 
if you can't answer it, it's not a big deal. It's just for curiosity. What's uh, what's the cost of that hot mix on average for in a year? Because I, I know the cost of what you're going to spend on the machine, which I'm I'm for. I just want to know what the cost is. Is it about that thirty or or? So we'll how still. Quick would we make it up? It's it's going to take five to seven years to recover our costs. Um, we typically buy a semi load of cold cold patch or send a truck to Denver to to uh, get oil um, every year. Um, the semi load of just the cold patch is thirteen thousand dollars. So usually lasts us about two years. The to, the benefit of this is we only have to buy the rejuvenator, which is like twelve dollars a a little bag, and it'll go. Oh, I don't know, 20 or so potholes. So we get a, a big bang for our buck, but it's it's probably a five-year investment to get a return, but the long-term uh, benefit outweighs that. And Harry, I think, did you talk about manpower too, that there's a difference in manpower needs? Sure. When, when we're chip sealing, it usually takes three to four guys, um, and it's at a much slower pace. We don't nearly get as much work done throughout a day as with this. We'll still probably use about the same manpower, but we're hitting several places at once. So um, benefit is it probably will reduce our manpower needs about by half or production will double. So I guess if, cause it, I, I looked, I looked it up a little bit and it does seem pretty efficient. I mean, I know you already did the numbers and said five years, but if you have that machine, is it going to, is it going to nudge you to do more? You know what I mean? And is it going to happen quicker? I, to me, it seems like with that tool, you're going to probably, get into where once it's working good and clean, you guys are going to be wanting to use it quite a bit more. Or So I, I, I'm for it. I think it's a good idea. Honestly, I, I think it's going to benefit our operations a lot. I think what we'll see is the impact, the, the amount we time we spend fixing potholes is probably going to be reduced. Um, you know, we'll be able to go through and make the repairs and not have to go back and re repair them later on again. Um, I think you'll see we're expecting to see uh, the production probably double where we're going to be out in the field probably less because we're going to be able to get more done in a quicker time. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Councilor Chris. Thank you. Um, and I also only have one question. The, the $25, the 25,000 that we're, if we were to purchase this now that we're taking out of this budget, um, what was it going towards before we're not missing a street or anything like that because we're we might decide to go this way no and, and that's kind of one of the reasons we're bringing it to you right now is because we need to order a cold patch for the winter and the early spring um that's that semi load of thirteen thousand. so we'd go to that and then some pick up some miscellaneous uh bulk material that we need for storage okay thank you thank you um councilor Krebs. now councilor jan v hill Ready to make my motion, Mayor, that we approve the reallocation of the 2020 street material budget, approximately 25,000, towards the purchase of an asphalt recycler with the remaining balance of 38,195 funded out of the 2024 street material budget. I second it. Good. All <laughs> right, we have a motion and uh, we have a second. Do we have any further discussion? If not, please start voting. Ms. Martinez? The motion carried unanimously. Thank you. That brings us to the next one, uh, brown water discussion. So this is always a, a hot topic in the city. You know, obviously we get coloration in our water anytime the the flow of the water is disrupted. And when I, when I say that, it's, it could be a, a broken line. It could be the guys exercising the valves, reversing the flow in our, and each, each line has kind of a loop system so we don't have stagnant water. Um, it's coupled by a lot of different things. And anytime it's just a, a disruption, you know, it might be a few houses or it might be, if we get a main break, it can be half the city. Um, I asked Roy to join me. He's our, our plan operator. He is uh, very, uh, knowledgeable of what happens and why we have the coloration. And so I'll let, I'll kind of turn it over to Roy um, with, with kind of talking about what happens and why we're seeing it, but also what we are doing staff wise, looking at maybe a, uh, a long-term, I'm not going to say fix something that will reduce the coloration in the water. 
Thank you for the introduction, Harry. <clears throat> Good evening, Council. Happy to be here and happy to talk about this and give some information. Um, as always, if you guys have any questions or concerns at any time, just feel free to reach out to me or anybody within the department that we can help answer these questions. But so we have this little topic and slideshow of red water, red discolored water. What can cause this to happen? So let's take a look at our treatment process that we have with the city. And let's look at the past. In August 2008, the water treatment facility went online. As we all know, arsenic is our primary contaminant of removal. To do that, we use an iron chemical called ferric chloride as a primary coagulant. And what, what the coagulant does, it's, it's kind of like a car battery. When it's in the water, it's got the opposite charge of the arsenic and the arsenic sticks to it. And then it, it makes a particle that then we can then filter out. So the arsenic binds to the ferric chloride and then we use membrane filtration, which you can kind of, there's a picture of what are a smaller version of what our membranes look like on the right to rem that removes the arsenic from the water. What causes this red or discolored water? So the ferric chloride chemical that we use for arsenic removal is made up of iron, manganese and other constituents. This dissolved iron and manganese are able to pass through the filters being dissolved. And when we add chlorine, which is an oxidant to the water that we need to add for disinfection and for a, a residual within the distribution system, it oxidizes it out. Um, this free chlorine will oxidize the dissolved iron and manganese, thus creating red discolored water that we can have within our distribution system. So why does this happen in our distribution system? When the iron and manganese oxidizes out, it settles out into the bottom portion of the water mains. And that picture on the left, um, where it's really dark in the bottom, that's kind of what it does in our mains. So if you give it enough time, it can just oxidize out and just slowly settles to the bottom of the mains and sits there real nice, right? When we have an event such as a fire or water main break that disturb that water and create a higher velocity, this causes um, it to speed up and it mixes and the sediment just gets everywhere within that water, like on the picture on the right, just turns it that color, so. So another question is, is this red discolored water safe? Yes, um, iron and manganese are considered a secondary maximum contaminant within the Colorado primary drinking water regulations. And this is out of page 369 of the primary drinking water regulations. States the secondary maximum contaminant levels, these contaminants in drinking water primarily affect the aesthetic qualities related to the public acceptance of drinking water. And there's a nice little picture of some of the bacteria samples we take saying that the water is bacteria free. And we do, so throughout the city every month too, we take 10 samples looking for total coliform bacteria within our water. And if there was something that happened to be there or make it be positive, the public and everybody would be the first to know. So at any time, and these are public records, so at any time you feel like you want to know or have more knowledge about it, come see me. So what are we doing to minimize this? Um, we're proactively flushing water mains to remove sediment. That's one way to take care of it. If we know that it's there, um, open up a fire hydrant, flush it out, right? It's gone. We are cleaning our storage tanks more often. Um, we've been on a five-year plan doing that, we're gonna move that to a three, maybe even less, depending on what our last uh, reports came back as, so we can be more proactive on that. We're And we're still in the, we're still replacing our old cast iron mains that we have within our distribution system. Um, we're being proactive on that with the Public Works Department doing that, notifying or no, understanding where we have these cast iron mains and what we need to do to replace them. And we're also working with the company called Aquametrology Systems, AMS, we're evaluating the use of using a more cleaner chemical compound to remove arsenic instead of the dirtier one, that bulk that we're getting now. So this chemical is pretty amazing because it can be made in place within the facility itself. We wouldn't need somebody bringing a truckload in and offloading chemical, stuff like that. And this chemical can be made in place within our facility and can provide a higher quality water leaving the drinking water facility while still providing excellent, if not even better, arsenic removal. So earlier this year in, um, 
end of January, beginning of February, we ran a small um, scale pilot to compare this chemical against the chemical that we're currently using. And we had some great results. Here's a picture of that, that we actually did within the plant itself. So we're, when we do these things, we're looking extensive at what the root cause is and what internal controls we can do within our facility and within our capabilities to help minimize this. So that picture kind of shows us a little bit about the pilot. It shows that there's a generator on the left-hand side and there's two, there's the light gray and the black uh, tanks. And we're running our current process with our chemical against the in situ, the, the in place chemical itself. So, and this is a chemical analysis from the pilot study. So, on the left, you have the parameters. Um, in the middle, you have the bulk ferric chloride that what we're currently using and what we currently purchase. And on the right, we have the electrolyte generated ferrous chloride reagent. And we can see that the two constituents that we're looking at when it comes down to red or dirty water is going to be the iron and manganese. So we can see by just comparing this as apples to apples, that by looking at this other type of chemical that's made in place, that we can reduce the amount of iron within the water and the amount of manganese, thus hopefully reducing the amount of discoloration that we could have within the distribution system. So these are some of the conclusions from the pilot we ran. The, the in situ chemical is a higher quality than the chemical we currently use. Uh, using a higher quality chemical provides higher quality water. It can provide better arsenic removal while using 27% less chemical. And we demonstrated the ability to remove arsenic to below five parts per billion, which is right now it's not too important, but if the EPA ever decides to lower that limit because they have a, a goal of zero, it shows that we're capable of meeting that too at the same time and not looking for another technology. Um, and using 27% less chemical can provide less iron and manganese in filtered water, again, giving the potential to providing less discolored water within the distribution system, so. I think one of the things that this doesn't capture is, is some of the cost benefits that we'll see in the future. One of the big uh, expenses at the water treatment plant is the membranes that filters out the arsenic. Uh, we're hoping that by by removing the high iron and manganese that's in the system, we'll extend the lives of those membranes. They cost about, we got a new price today, they're about $150,000 a year for one membrane. So, and uh, I think long-term, if this pilot study, you know, we're able to move forward with it, we're gonna see not only benefit in the in the colored water, but also savings and longevity in our, in our membrane replacement. Questions? Okay, Councillor Hensley. Thanks, Roy, for such a great explanation. Um, my question is, and I don't know if you really know. I guess two. Does it, is it? Are we getting more of this colored water than we have in the past? Like, it feels like more people have commented having the colored water or red water or brown water or whatever. So, um, so that's a good question. So the amount is probably always the same amounts always been there. So over time, like you can have that accumulation of it going in the bottom of the pipes. So the same amount is being put in, it's just a matter of when an event happens and we're not gonna be able to know where that happens for it to get out, if that makes sense. So do you think um, we're having more events that maybe is making it feel like it's happening more? Yes. Okay. So so when a, when there's a fire, for instance, we're, we're increasing that if somebody, um, happens to get on the water main and we're flushing out, you know, stuff like that. Or if so, there's a contractor that hits a water main, we're gonna have these occurrences happen, so. Thank you. And Harry, is, has there been a difference in the quality of the, is that what you're getting ready to say? Yeah, there's two other things. We were, at, until two years ago, we were able to buy a higher grade ferric material um, that that did help with the reduction in, in, in the, the uh, iron and manganese. Um, but also, I think this time of year, we see quite a bit as well. So people who choose to blow out their sprinkler systems, they may hook into the city systems not correctly, and they're air, putting air within the water line. So every once in a while, I'll hear somebody say, hey, we got some gurgling in our water line, or they change the, the flow within the, you know, the, their, their 
private line back into the main and it's and it's stirring things up. So we, we typically do see a higher amount of calls this time of year as people are blowing out their sprinklers, largely because of that. Okay, um, well, I don't see any other lights, so I'll just wrap things up too. Um, Roy, first of all, I wanna just recognize you for your credentials that you have in water. Uh, a lot of people don't know this, but a lot of his credentials is really rare uh, and hard to find people like Roy uh, in our community with the skill sets that he has and the training that he's has he has taken over the years. So I just wanna recognize you for that. And then the second thing is the question I have for you, uh, other than uh, replacing the cast iron uh, water mains, what other equipment you feel we should start including in our budget for replacing uh, in the future? Pertaining to the red water, I guess. Yes. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna be more proactive on cleaning our water tanks um, more often, and with our flushing program, if it if it's coming down to what some of the needs that we would might be looking into, we're looking into running a full scale demonstration on the pilot plant um, so we can confirm what we're seeing is a reduction in iron and manganese that's gonna be in this water using a different chemical. Okay, thank you. And then one other question. I'm not for sure how many people have been calling in or checking in and are having any concerns about the groundwater. Uh, is there any way we could put some of that information on the website? So if, if anyone have any concerns, they could uh, go there and, and, and learn more? I think that's certainly uh, uh, we something we need to do because there's a little bit of a process as, as, as you notice coloration in your water, you kind of don't try to flush it out yourself. You really need to contact public works. Let us flush the main first. So we have clear water to your house and then you flush out just your lateral line into your home. Um, a lot of times homeowners, they start opening up their own faucets, trying to, to rid the coloration themselves while they're just bringing more into their home. So, you know, I think some public uh, education and information is certainly something we can, we can follow up on. Okay, thank you. And Councilor uh, Jan V. Hill and then Councilor Carson. Thank you, Mayor. I was gonna go off of what, kind of what you said, Mayor. Can we get this out to the public? This presentation of why water, red water might happen and the manganese and all that, can we get that out so people know? Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor uh, Jan V. Hill. Okay, Councilor Carson. So, um, like, let's just say in a neighborhood, uh, when you flush the main, what's the length of time that it takes for that that ball? You know, you have the two pictures with the with the with the disturbed water and the one that was settled. When you have that settle settling in the main, and you flush it, two questions: Does it clean the main out on the bottom, or is that stuff hardened? And if you do clean it out. How long does it take to build up in that neighborhood again? Ish. So I, th I think it's a good question, and a lot of it depends on the event. If it's a if it's a main break, one of the main lines, you're going to have a big disruption, and it's going to break a lot of that material at the bottom of the line loose, and it's going to take a while to flush. So you'll see the guys flush and ten or twelve hydrants at once trying to clear this big area. Um, it could take you know a few minutes, or it could take an hour or two of just continually cycling that water until they get everything clean. Um, also, depending on the impact, you know, it's iron and manganese is, you know, being a metal, it's fairly heavy. heavy. So, you know, does it come be, get compacted at the bottom? I don't know that I got an answer for that. It, um, it'll definitely, you'll definitely pull the top off with any disruption, but I think it takes a big impact to really remove it. And, and then it's kind of what I said when, in the beginning is, we know we can reduce this amount of iron and manganese that's, that's getting distributed but long-term, how long will it take to get everything out of the lines? You know, we'll, we'll probably continue to see that for a while, but we, all we can do at this point is try to continue to reduce it. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, I don't see any other lights on, so we would like to thank you all so very much for this discussion, very helpful. Thank you. Okay, thank and you. If I could, Mayor, sure. um, I just wanna recognize Roy. He has taken the lead on this this uh, project, this pilot study, all on his own, um, working with AMS to try to evolve our plant. And uh, he and I have attended a couple conferences and, and partnered with some other outside uh, entities trying to 
see if this is a viable option for the city and and, and really kudos to Roy because had he not shown the interest in trying to make a change, we wouldn't be where we're at. So. Thank you. Thank you, Roy. Thank you. Okay. Thank you guys. Okay. That brings us to uh, the next item is um, discussion on the purchase of foreclosed home. Me again. Okay. All right. I'm not really sure where to start on this one, but we'll just start at the beginning, I guess. Back on October 31st, Amy McKinley, the treasurer from the county, reached out to the city and notified us about a property that was adjacent to the water treatment plant that was up for foreclosure sale. So internally, we talked about it and uh, approached Heather with the idea of purchasing this, this property. This is a property that goes clear back to 2007 when the water treatment facility was, the planning was being developed. Grand Harm. You can see on the left, that's 2006, that's 2007. So when we looked at this property, how, how would the city need to evolve, you know, in the development, um, what its future needs will be. And uh, they reached out, as the plant was getting developed, uh, being built, they reached out to the adjacent property owners on the bottom. Um, go ahead, Holly where the trees are at, there's two houses there. The one with the white roof um, was a, was owned by a private entity. And then there's one you can't quite see in the trees. It's just to the left of the one in the white roof that was also privately owned, seeking first rights of refusal. Or if they were interested in selling at that time, they would purchase the, the property. Um, I think, I, I don't have a definitive answer whether uh, the, the property that Miss Livius, Livius, leaves his name, uh, Livius owned, they were, they were in negotiations and talks about first right of refusal. So if and when they ever sold, the city would be in the first line. So um, the house on the right, the white roof, they ended up selling that property in 2009 to the city. Go ahead. We bought that uh, for $50,000. And then when, when Amy, reached out to the city and let us know that the other one was available. And again, this wasn't a sale, it was a foreclosure. Um, asked if, if the city was, if that was a property the city would want to purchase, we did go ahead and purchase that property for $48,124. If you look up at the, the picture there, um, you could see kind of the current yard um, layout with the blue line that goes around the perimeter. Uh, we plan on demoing the city house, the one that we've owned since 2009 here in January. And the purpose for that really is the loading dock that's on the south end of the water treatment plant. You can see that slab of concrete. That's for semis to be able to back in and be able to load, unload bulk uh, fluids and materials, membranes. We've never been able to use that just because of the house has been in the way. Um, if you look at the the structure wall line on the, the west side or the left side of the water treatment plant, when and if the plant needs to expand, go ahead, Holly. Oh, just a few pictures of the house. This is the house we purchased um, just recently in November. You can kind of see the, the, the water treatment plant right there on the upper right-hand corner. We have just a little alley right now to access that dock. Keep going, Holly, go, there we go. Um, looking at that wall line, if we were ever wanting and needing to expand the plant, we would need to continue south. That's That was the design of the, the original design of the plant was when that was needed to be done, we would go to the south. It's, so that's kind of the reason we've been looking at purchasing those properties. Um, the way the city is growing currently, we'll need to do an expansion, you know, many years from now, but at some point when we when we have to expand that plant, we'll need to go south as that's the, the way the plant was designed. CDPHE continued regulations. We don't know what they'll come out with next, what will, how the plant will have to evolve. So having space and additional room to grow is something that we feel is a, a great need for the future for the water operations at the plant. Um, I think that's all I really have other than questions. I'm sure Heather might have a comment, but 
Um, so this is something where it was a fairly tight time frame that it, when it was brought to our attention, I think we had something like 20 hours to decide on if we were going to move forward and, and purchase. I think from a foreclosure perspective, properties are usually go through a process for a, about a year before it reaches the point that then it was brought to, to our attention. And so we had to move quickly and, and knowing the value that this property has to potential expansion and the current access um, for semis, we we moved quickly and, and we're planning to then um, bring it up to council for a, for a budget amendment type of situation. It was during my meeting with um, Councilor Jackie Vigil um, that the concerns of the current resident were were shared. And so instead of it just being an update, we wanted to bring it up to, to city council um, to get direction in, in regards to what you would like us to do. Our first priority is to make sure we maintain ownership um, type of situation. Um, but then there's a lot of options within that to, to where we can maintain ownership. And if, if council feels, you know, that, that we need to look at a reasonable time frame to move forward of getting the house vacated, you can set some time frames for that. Or if council feels like um, maybe there's not an urgency to to get it vacated and, and demolished, that it could be a few years of of leasing it um, to the to cur the current person, um, you could provide direction in regards to something like that as well. And so we just wanted to have this discussion with you tonight. Okay. So we're gonna open it up here in a minute. And I just wanna recognize um, uh, attorney uh, Mark Loy, who's here tonight and, and, and who's taking over our regular uh, attorney, Eric Sweezow. We wanna thank you for being here tonight. And um, we'll go ahead and open up the mics. What we'll do is I know everybody's gonna probably wanna have something to say. I'll recognize your mics as you turn them on. So far I have a uh, counselor Carson followed by counselor Hensley. Councillor Krebs, then Councillor, um, we'll let Councillor, well, I'll tell you what, how about we do it this way? Um, we'll go ahead and start with Councillor Carson since he had his mic on first. We'll go to you, Councillor Hensley, then we'll go this way and back until we get all your answers or questions taken care of. Councillor uh, Carson. Um, so I do, I do like your second option for the extended period of time. I, I have questions. I, you know, I apologize to Will. He called me last month and then stuff happened and we got kind of buried. And so I apologize for not reaching out back to you. I didn't have a clue as to what was going on with this property till tonight. Um, I have a ton of questions for you. You know what I mean? That I, I won't ask you right now because to me, this feels like a, it's a little reactive, you know what I mean? And, and it sucks. I, I can't say anything else. It's a bad situation, but um, I would really convey my, my feelings to council is that we look at the, the uh, longest amount of time. I don't see an urgency to, to, to vacate the property. Um, and, and if, and if there is an urgency, you'd have to really enlighten me on that, especially because again, this all feels really kind of ghoulish just from a, from an overarching standpoint. But um, I do like your suggestion, and so I would I would, you know, request the council that we consider the second option better. Um, and again, will I mean, you know, we can have a private conversation about it. But I have questions about this beyond what I think I should ask here. So uh, that's my opinion. I think we give these people as much time as necessary. You know, um, I don't see an urgency in it. I, I really don't, and I understand the water plant is expanding, but. I think we got a ton of other crap on the front burner right now. So thank you. Thank you, Councilor Carson, Councilor uh, Hensley, and then Councilor Jackie Vigil. So um, ironically, I was eating at Ruby Slipper last night. And so Pam mentioned something to me last night about it. So for me, that was sort of the first that I was aware of a situation. I'm probably similar to you as I, I guess I do have questions as well. One question I want to ask now, though, is when a house is foreclosed so is that i guess what's that process so is there anybody then can try to get that house is there a chance for the owner to 
get that house out of foreclosure? I guess I, I just don't know how maybe some So of those... I think there's plenty of notices that the bank does. I'm asking Rachel to come up here. And so through that time frame and those opportunities, the owner can take advantage of preventing the foreclosure. Um, Rachel, if you want to talk about the length of time, but essentially anyone can come by it. The bank is foreclosing and we have nothing to do with that type of situation. We just happen to be an interested party who's going to purchase it. It, it was a public auction. It was a public it auction. A public so auction. yeah, if you guys can answer more of, of Councillor Hensley's questions. It was a public, so the foreclosure was known, given, they were giving notice for a year. So it's my understanding that they were given notices from last January. So January of 23 up until the sale when we purchased it. And so the only difference the, that the city was involved was that Amy let us know the sale was happening. We went to a public auction. We had to be there, um, you know, and be there in person to purchase the home. But anyone could have been there to outbid us. It just happened to be that we were the only bidders. And so we bought it for what was due. Um, but, but really, it was just an open auction. So from that perspective, it's kind of a done deal. In every other foreclosure sale, I mean, I. We are the proud owners of this yeah. property. Is that what you're asking? <laughs> yeah. We are the owners of the property. Okay. And, and it could have been anyone. I mean, the foreclosure list is on the county's website. It's always, it's updated regularly. Like generally in my years at the county foreclosure sales, especially if the home is involved, are well attended and they almost always sell unless there's some defect in the home or it's too expensive, which is unusual, but usually foreclosed homes sell. This was just sort of a weird isolated incident. And Amy McKinley, because she worked for the city, knew that it had been a priority to obtain that property. That's all I have for right now. Okay. Councilor Jackie uh, V. Hill. Um, I'm in agreement with um, Councilman Carson, I don't see the urgency in removing the person from the property right now. Um, I I don't know what the circumstances were till you said that it was on a foreclosure and it had been that way for a year. But I still see I I don't see the urgency in removing Mr. Olivas at this time. Okay, thank you. Councilor Cripps, then Councilor Jan Vigil. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so my initial question, because foreclosures usually drag on for a very long time um, to try and get resolved before it hits that point, was why the city had that 20 hour, all of a sudden it was like a hurry up. And so it sounds like it was because of the notice of the sale. Um, we just weren't aware of it. We hadn't been following the foreclosures. Okay. So that it had been properly noticed plenty mm -hmm. of time. We just weren't following the foreclosures. Okay. So that's why there was a, a, a feeling of rushed. So by the time the city realized it, it was already the very next day. Yes. This is when, okay. Um, so that answers my question. Um, I agree. I, if, if we are the proud owners and I know that we try very hard not to be the proud owners of occupied things like trailer parks. Um, but if we are the owners of this house and through Harry's slideshow, um, we've already purchased the property with the white roof and that's going to get taken down in January, um, which gives more, from I can tell from the picture, it gives more access to the dock from that direction we have, we do have some time before there is a need for that property or for a use to that property. Um, so I agree, but I also feel that there should be parameters around that and that um, working with the person in the home to set a timeline possibly to, and not in any way to rush, but just to make sure that everybody on both sides is very clear about the the wins and the wares behind it. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Krebs. Councilor um, Jan Vigil, then Councilor Hensley. So I'm having, I'm struggling. I don't I don't I don't want to say we're the proud owners of 
someone else's home. Like, um, how, first of all, how much was this? 48,000 in some change. 48,000. Is that, yeah. is, is a purchase like that? Does that need to come before us? So for the emergency side, we had to move quickly and we didn't, you weren't having a meeting within those 20 hours type of situation. Mm -hmm. So then what we have to do is then report it to you. Um, mm -hmm. And it comes before you as a budget amendment. And then, and then a question that I had that you asked Ms. Krebs, I thought was great is because Harry, in your, in your presentation, you said that uh, access to that dock would be a lot better now that we have that other property that you're going to take down in January. So, right. right. So that's good, right? Yes. Yeah. And so, and so, okay, that's great. And um, I, I don't know much about foreclosures. So I'm not going to act like I do, but I, I do know Will. I used to work with Will about 14, 15 years ago. He's a good guy. He's a hustler. He works his butt off. I know his mom was sick. Um, and I just don't, I don't like the situation that we're in council. I don't, I don't, I think we should give him more time to get this property back. Like, I just, I don't know. I don't like it. Councilor Rio, thank you. Uh, Councilor uh, Hensley. So I think, um, so similar to what everybody else has said, I mean, I have real concerns in regards, but again, I, I also don't know a whole lot about foreclosure and how all those steps, like, I don't know if, if we hadn't bought it, what would happen? It would have stayed on the foreclosure list for sale. So it just would have gone up for auction again. So I guess one of the things, and so Harry, when you were saying that you, and I, I know you showed the slides, but it kind of went fast. So when you say that um, that part of it is more for, as we continue to grow, do you have, I mean, could that be like, five, 10 years down the road? There's nothing in the immediate future. It's just for us looking at the opportunity, it's been, gosh, 20, almost 20 years since this plan took place. So the one time in 20 years we have the opportunity to secure the property, that's what we needed to do at that point if it was available. When it comes around again, or if it would ever to have come around again, we don't know, you know, it may not have been in our lifetime. So. That was the intent of of that. Do we have an immediate need for it at this moment? No. So for this moment, like I said, I guess I kind of want to digest stuff too, but I am 100% on board is I would like it that, that obviously we're looking now could be your lifetime maybe, you know, that idea of potentially until, and obviously I think when we get to that point that you might decide you need that obviously you're going to know a little bit ahead of time and there'll be that whole planning process. So that would give time to sort of think that through. Correct. Correct. Yes. And, a, and a lot, so that's why we wanted to make sure and offer you some, some different options and, and make sure we were clear on that for that portion of it, there's not necessarily an urgency, but still maintaining ownership is important. So we could look at setting up a, you know, a, a landlord tenant type of relationship um, in the prior house, the, with the white rooftop, we used to do the same thing um, there type of thing. So we can look at setting something like that up. And when you did it, so if you did this before, um, was it done at a sort of that fair level? Like, obviously, this is a $48,000 house. We're in a time frame where rent can go really, really high. Are we able then to to do the rent towards what we actually pay. For. I think what we take a look at is what were the mortgage payments and, and I don't know if the house is worth more than 48 because that's what the bank had from that perspective, but we're not in this to make money either. So we would just need to take, look, take a look at a few different price points and then make sure it's covering any type of cost we might have to from an insurance or other type of things like that. Okay, so Ms. Sanchez, before we start this second round, it seems like I have lights back on again. Can you go over those options you presented at the beginning so we're still clear on what those numbers are? So there's kind of different variations, but you know, if if council felt that there was an urgency, which I'm not hearing that, um, we would move forward with a reasonable amount of time, you know, 
whatever reasonable is determined to, to look at getting the structure vacated so we could demolish it. If council felt that there wasn't an urgency, which is more of what I'm hearing tonight, um, we can move into then looking at a tenant landlord type of situation, look at different price points, um, that type of stuff. And then council could do, we want that until we have to expand or we want that for two years, five years. There's a whole bunch of different variations with that option. Okay. All right, so we'll go ahead and start the second round. I'll start with Councilor Carson again, and we'll go that way with the lights that are on. Councilor Carson? Um, I'm, I'm comfortable with that, what you just said. Uh, I do want to talk with Will a little bit. I need some backstory. Um, I, I just, I, I need to do that. But I, I agree with what you're saying, and I, I would really... Um, I think as anything moves forward or as that plan's coming together, those numbers or whatever just apprise us, keep us in that loop so that we're we're aware of what's going on. So that that's my request. And and I think you know, we need to move forward with that. And this is a rough situation. So I, I think we need to be as um as yeah, as compassionate as possible. Thank you, Liz. I appreciate that. No, you're that's wrong. Okay. Thank you, Council Carson. Uh Council Jackie B. Hill. So I've known Will all his life and he lives in my neighborhood. And I think we all need to keep in mind that this is a family home and it's been in his family for years and years and years. And I think we have to show some compassion here because it, it is, it's his family home. It's his kind of his legacy. Okay, thank you, um, Councillor Jackie V. Hill. Councilor uh, Jan Vigil. Thank you. I agree, Ms. Vigil. Uh, <laughs> and I would take it a step further. I would like to maybe see a situation where Will can get the get the land back. If this is not a pressing issue, then he should be able to find a way to figure this out in his own personal life. I get that. But to get the land back. Thank you. Councilor Krebs. Heather, I know it wasn't one of the options, but you had mentioned and we have spoken before about when we acquire properties, we we go in with the um, when they're done with that property, then it, we would get first bid on it that had been mentioned. Is, is that a possibility of. So there's two there's two considerations. The first one is the the path you're heading on. So if if council wants to consider allowing um, the individual to to purchase it for any of the costs that we have, because it I think it's forty eight thousand, but there might have been some final. I don't know if there's some minor fees associated. Um, we would very much want there to be a right of first refusal that stays attached to the property. Um, the only other issue is just to be aware that. 48 is not the value of the house. Um, it's what was owed to the bank type of situation. So going forward, if the if the house is going to change hands, it's more than likely not going to come at $48,000, right? A first refusal only gets you the chance to buy it at what they could get paid for by somebody else. So it, it, we could probably say it's probably not going to come to us at $48,000. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Carson. Um, so, I mean, even with that plan, as, as we move forward with that, uh, be thinking about, and, and I challenge you with this, Harry, uh, as you guys are moving forward with some of these plans, if, if there is a way to even accommodate um, the need for the space that was going to be needed. And I saw the, the property was quite big and the house was in a weird spot there. But I mean, if there's a way to, to use that as an easement or even, you know, something that, that the city would have right to, even if he did proceed with some sort of purchase, again, I understand it's probably not going to be valued at the 48, but being as that's what it was purchased for, or that's what the bank was owed. I think we should try to work with them in that, in that, um, you know, neighborhood. So 
just think about that. If there's something else, a modification to the law or anything that, that can be done to keep that price range and something that's reasonable for them to try to buy it back. Is that, that, that would be, I think what would be ultimately, you know, the best turnout. Councillor Hensley. I feel like there was a time and I forget what the property was or where it was that we were able to negotiate that maybe it's the little houses that were by um, where we're going to build the bridge. But anyway, I'm wondering, and again, this would be a negotiation thing. If we bought it, if we allowed him to buy it back, but somehow in that contract that there was a, a flexible or some sort of restriction or idea that obviously let's say all of a sudden it was worth a hundred thousand or something, but that idea there that if it at first refusal, there's a limit to what that could I, I'm not I'm not wording this right at all. <laughs> so that idea though that let's say we bought it back and obviously we're trying to do something that's the right thing is that so we don't necessarily get totally burned in the end, you know, in the sense because it's city money, that idea that maybe somehow in that contract, and again, I'm not sure what the situation is, so it would have to be see if it works for both ways, but it wouldn't go to a super high amount if it ever got sold to us. So what I'm going to recommend to council is for us to have an executive session at the next council meeting, because I think there could be some legal considerations that you guys need to be made aware of. And that's what the whispering was over here. Mm -hmm. um, so, so obviously nothing's going to happen between now and the next council meeting. Um, so nobody, you don't know, needs to be worried or anything like that, but then that allows, um, our, our legal minds to, to get together and provide some some legal information to city council. So that I believe is December 20th. Would that, is that, so we can continue this discussion, but it, it there that, that could be a, a, a helpful thing as well. Council Cripps. And I'm hearing you. And so what I'm just clarifying is that um, the, Gentlemen can stay in the house while we figure this out. Yes. No matter what, no matter how long it takes. It, there's there's well, no I rush. I think she's saying that. No, we're December we're we'll yeah. figure it out. Yep. Executive session. So it's no matter, not no matter what. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Counselor. Okay. Is that it? Council no. Carson, go ahead. So that confused me. So I, I get what you're saying about the 20th, but if trying to come up with some plan to have him buy it back is going to kill the chance of him having to be out. I mean, we just talked about, you know, lifetimes or, or, you know, a long time. I, you know, I would suggest that from your standpoint, we've figured out something where you can lease it onto whatever. But again, I understand it's family property. You know what I mean? But I'm not trying to. No. So I don't think it's going to take us back. I don't think it's going to hurt anything. I just think it would be good for you guys to get some legal advice. I always get scared when lawyers start whispering. Yeah. No, I don't. I don't think it's anything to be concerned about. All right. I think Thanks. this allows well, all of us a little let's time let's to also. Let's let him oh, respond, sorry. please. Mr. Mayor and Council, I mean, certainly my brain is available if y'all wanted to avail yourselves of that. Um, as as an attorney, and I do uh, a lot of different law, and I also do real estate law as well, there's a lot of legal issues here that I am happy to uh, talk to the council about if you ask me to um, in an executive session, or certainly you can ask Mr. Suiso that when he's back in two weeks. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Lloyd. Okay. All right. I don't see any other lights on a mic on so we'll for now we'll just pretty much uh wait for that executive session uh nothing's going to happen to the property or anything and then we'll have further discussion okay all right all right good deal all righty that brings us to the next item on the agenda uh under city manager legal discussion on uh Desired qualities for police chief. Am I? Am oh, I yes. Thank you, Mayor. Yeah. So um, I think as we've worked through the, the items and, and re 
looking at replacing um, Chief Anderson. One of the things council communicated is they'd like and have an opportunity to share different qualities um, that they'd like to see in the next police chief. Usually when I'm meeting um, with a department where we have a department head vacancy, what I'll ask the employees is, you know, in addition to qualities, um, what are maybe some of the big issues you see for the department as well that you, you, the, the person would need to have the skills or the experience to tackle or know how to handle type of situation. So, um, with that, you know, I'm here to take notes. Okay, good deal. So we're going to handle this the same way and we'll keep going back and forth, um, so that everybody has an opportunity to make all their comments. Uh, we'll start off to the left with Councillor Hensley, go to Councillor Carson, go to Councillor Jackie V. Hill, Councillor Krebs, and then Councillor Young V. Hill, and we'll do it again to make sure that everybody gets a chance to voice what they feel is important. Councillor uh, Hensley? I'm gonna take a pass for the first round. Okay, no worries. Okay, uh, Councillor Jackie Veal. I'm gonna do the same because I'm not really sure. Okay, Councillor Cribs. Um, similar similar to my peers here, but what I'm hoping is that you're gathering those kind of ideas from the police, the, the people in the police department and, and maybe surrounding police departments about what the need here is in the San Luis Valley, because we, we can look for, for values and we can look for skills and experiences from a police chief that can tick all the boxes but we have to hear from the people there on the streets here what they need and what they look for. And so I would be um, interested to, to hear that. So I would just spread that net a little wider past the council to um, officers and, and people Mayor, on the street. I just want to share, I didn't want to lead it, but once you go down the whole line, I can share some of the ideas we have as well as kind of what the process is looking like. Okay, yeah, let us let us finish the line and then we'll we'll go back to you. Uh, Councilor Vigil. Mayor, I had to go to the bathroom real quick, I'm sorry. Okay, so what we started down on this end, Councilor uh, Young Vigil, uh, we asked if anyone wanted to make any recommendations of the characteristics that um, they would like for uh, the city manager to look for when we're hiring a police chief. Um, Councillor Hensley passed the comment. Councillor um, Carson didn't make comments and Councillor Jackie V. Hill didn't make comments. So when you walked in, Councillor uh, Cripps were make, was making a comment. So you're the, the last one before me. Thank you, Mayor. You're welcome. Uh, I think that desired qualities for the police chief, like 90% of that should be driven by what our police officers want. Um, I do think back to the, the, the qualities of Chief Anderson. He was phenomenal at uh, getting into the community, getting it. My big thing is the schools. He was at the schools. He, the, uh, the principals knew him. Administration knew who he was. They knew, they know the officers. They know that they're there, they're present. That's a big one for me. Um, and then like, what we think, and this is maybe a discussion that we need to have council is on some of these hot button issues, like homelessness, like the lead program. If this is our direction as council, I, I think we would want a police chief who is going to Um, run with those ideas and do do the things that we're that we want as a council because that's that's what the people elected us to do. Um, and and I think we're gonna have a, a really good discussion on the lead program here in a couple of weeks and 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 stuff like that. So, um, and I will say this, and I, I don't I don't I'm not at all gonna hide from this comment is, and this is not a this is not a requirement from me at all. But I will say this, 50% of this town and this county are Hispanic. I think having people in leadership positions who are who are Hispanic can go a long way. Thank you. 
Okay, thank you, uh, Council Vigil. Since I'm the last one on this round, I'll go ahead and make my comments. I do have some comments. Um, one of the first things that I would like for you to look for is someone with integrity. And to me, integrity is defined as what a person, what they do when nobody's watching, when the cameras are not on. So integrity is number one. Number two, I'm looking for someone with excellent, excellent leadership skills. Someone who has the experience uh, to lead uh, the police department uh, because we need people with not only leadership skills, but skills to manage, supervise, follow up and follow through, not only with the law enforcement officers to make sure that all of their concerns are being addressed, but also with the community uh, in which they're responsible for protecting. So those are a few of the uh, characteristics that I'm looking for um, in the next uh, police chief. And then I'll let other council members now, well, Ms. Ms. Uh, Sanchez, we had more lights come on before you made your comments. So now that we have council members actually making comments, I think for now, we'll let them continue to, to, to voice their concerns and then we'll come back to you. Councilor uh, Hensley. So I had to collect my thoughts and think for a second. So um, I would like to have, I guess a trait I look for is that balance that supports and understands the challenges of a police officer, what they're doing. Obviously we're in times of change. Um, and so being able to also adjust and when you have a change management type of philosophy is how do you bring the others along with some of that change that's happening? And this is just from a, a there's new policies, rules, all sorts of laws that um, you know affect the police. But I think also that that chief would also advocate and or be able to verbalize or voice and I think our, our um, work sessions will help with this, where we've talked about we'll have um, all the different leads at these meetings again. But that idea that let's say we have something that we're suggesting, um, whether it's a homeless camp or whatever the next new thing might be, is hearing from the police chief side of it in regards to some challenges that we're not considering, because that I know for me anyway, might change then the direction that I'm encouraging hearing that perspective. So I think it's somebody who has, um, is able to voice and pull the data that's needed if there is some challenges to some of the suggestions because there's so much new stuff. So I think having that ability, but also really supporting and being there for the police officers at the same time, understanding some of that change that's happening. Thank you, uh, Councilor Hensley. Councilor Carson, we're back to you again. You might want to turn the mic on. I, uh, I've seen some excellent qualities in some in the leaders we have in our PD now. And um, I would suggest that you ask these questions to people like, like um, Chief Spangler, uh, some of the qualities that he's shown in the last couple, three weeks and having to deal with all this got thrown in his lap um, are excellent. And so, I mean, talk to him. If you can get a guy like him, I think you're doing pretty good. Um, that's about all I have to say. I mean, I think when we were talking about this, it was more a lot of Councilor Griego pushing that we wanted to talk with these, with these new candidates you have. Um, I mean, you know, the mayor said he he wants these qualities in a person. We all do. We all want integrity. We all want a good leader. But again, I think somebody that's been here and understands the Valley is going to be a better fit than just somebody who can deal with progressive ideas. I mean, I'm not, you know, I'm saying those are important, but again, you got to talk to guys like him that are in the trenches every day. Um, some of the stuff I've seen from this guy lately, man, I know he probably doesn't want the responsibility, but I would I would really wish that he would stay on as, as chief or or we would give him the consideration that he needs because uh, he's shown great leadership, especially in a time of crisis. And that's when you see real leaders come through when the when the when it hits the fan, the people that are there and are solid are the ones you really need to depend on. And he's shown that. 
So again, I think those are the questions. These questions are the ones you have to ask him and his team. Thank you, Council Carson. You good? I'm good. Okay, you yeah. good? Okay, you good? Good. Okay. So, um, Ms. Sanchez, I know you wanted to. I was just stuff. offering because it seemed fairly no comments. So mm -hmm. I was just offering to help kickstart it, but I think everyone's commented and, and I've taken notes. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. That brings us to the next item on the agenda. Uh, committee reports. Do we have any committee report? Councilor Krebs. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I have two. Do I have two? I have three. I think the arts district meeting. It's the holidays, folks. <laughs> it's all bundled together. Um, so I'll start with that. We had a second meeting of the creative arts district. We are starting to um, speak on what that looks like for a boundary. And I'm very excited with the progress that's being made on that and we're also trying to think outside the bar box about what kind of arts can be incorporated into that because we spoke about the history and the culture as well and so that it was a very exciting conversation and we are actually um meeting again this month it's an every other month meeting but for the first little bit they they were very excited as a group and they were very they're very cohesive as a group. And so it was so fun to see. And I'm looking forward to this month's meeting and seeing um, where they're gonna take some of their ideas and their thoughts. Um, from there, I was at the Homeless Coalition meeting. Um, that one was, was very well thought out. They have spent many months pulling together different ideas of and conversations around how to educate the, the community on homeless issues and how that ties into housing and, and all the, the issues that ripple out from homelessness. And so they're getting ready to um, pull in different aspects of marketing into this and seeing what works best on presenting it to the community. And so that's, that's very good to see. Um, they've gathered all their data and now they're figuring out not when, but, but what's the best way to get it out to the general public. And then lastly, I was on the library board um, meeting just last night and they, we went over the survey results the library had recently and celebrated the fact the library was very successful in receiving a few grants that increased the outreach of the library into other communities and so, and just the benefit that's coming from that. And so just watching all that move forward and going over this year's budget and what we're gonna be able to do with all of that information. So thank you. Okay, thank you. Can I ask a question? Sure, go ahead. Um, I'm speaking to them. Councilor Krebs, well, you, you mentioned on your first, uh, your first update about the creative district. Um, when you guys are discussing boundaries, uh, I would ask that you guys uh, consider, I know we've, we've kept like the State Avenue right below where Alta's at and where Ruthie's shop is at kind of out of that area. But I think with the project like that, and I know not everybody's excited about the project, but with the hotel that size coming into that area, you're going to have a lot of spillover of people that are bored people that want stuff to do they may walk they may you may start getting some more foot traffic the station on state's getting remodeled hopefully that'll be nice and new and brand new and so if you guys are as you're considering that i would just request that you guys consider moving that boundary down there a little bit and and uh i think it would really i think we could use some art there near alta and stuff and if if the artists are willing to put it down there but if you guys would consider that that would be awesome um that has not only been considered Councillor Carson, it was happily discussed. Um, when we're, they talked about boundaries, the half the talk was um, discussing Main Street and its effect of the art that's currently there. But then 
the boundary doesn't have to be a perfect rectangle. It can go off into other areas. So while nothing's been solidified, um, the farm park was mentioned. Obviously, Adams State was mentioned for its theater and its contributions of art to the community and expanding it upwards to make sure Society Hall is um, taken care of. Um, Friars Fork, which has recently become a hot music scene, um, things of that nature. So going that way, going the other direction, of course, um, the parks, the cultural aspect of the parks, and then going going across. And one of the things that um, it surprised me because I, I was surprised because I hadn't thought of it, but the group discussed um, going all the way down to the radio station because the radio station is such a historical cultural um, speaking point of the community. One of the things for the art district that isn't coming from us, it's coming from the people that we hope to attract with it is that it is walkable. So there is a limit to the distance that we can extend the boundaries, but looking at other areas and other neighborhoods that have the art district, it was, um, some were very expansive, some were very um, compact. And so it's just finding what our voice is with that and being able to share it with everybody. But you're welcome. Okay, all righty, um, Councillor. <clears throat> so I had a uh, golf board, I don't know, a couple of weeks ago, um, obviously winding down for the season. I don't have the numbers in front of me, but they definitely exceeded all expectations on all different levels. Um, they're doing really, really well. And so since the city has taken over, I think each year it's just more, um, it ju just the growth of the amount of people that go, the money that's being brought in, et cetera. Um, and even for winter, they're setting up the uh, simulator. They've got all sorts of plans. Obviously, it's not going to be like it is when it's in season, but it's not like they're just shutting down. They have plans for doing things for off season. So golf course is going well and lots of new and exciting things. Okay. Thank you, Councilor Hansley. I just want to share, I sat next to John at, at a potluck today and the irrigation system's going really well as well. We were so lucky to have the grant and then Andy figuring out that that one city pulled out so they could fit us in and, and all of that. So all of that hustling seems to be really paying off. I, I think they got the main line and three holes done. So then in spring, they're going to throw a lot of manpower at it and it might only take two weeks to finish the last of the holes. So the disruption to play should be minimal. Okay. Thank you. That brings us to staff announcements. Oh, that's me. Mm -hmm. So um, as Jim's making his way up here, we do need to have a sponsorship committee meeting, um, either probably the beginning of January, um, Councillor V Hills, um, one of the council members, the other one was Councillor Griego or Mayor Pro Tem Griego. Do I have a volunteer to serve this one time on the sponsorship committee? I know Councillor Carson, you were previously on it. Um, okay. Does that work for council? Okay, so I'll send an email because we need to let those who are having events at the first half of the year kind of know how that goes. Thank you. Bless you. Okay. Good evening, Mr. Okay. Mayor, Council. Um, I come to you tonight to talk about a situation that we had on November 27th where we pretty much lost all production in our network for the day. Um, IT was able to stabilize the problem for the next business day. Uh, and that next day, we spent most of that night uh, really drilling down on what the problem was. Uh, we thought it was switching that was some problem in our network switching that was going on. And it turned out to be we have a device called a, a SAN. It's a storage area network, expensive piece of hardware that all the city servers run on. And that device has redundancy built into it. Um, one of the, the primary controller on that device uh, had failed in such a state that it was falsely reporting that it was working. And it was confusing our network in that it wasn't truly transmitting when it was some of it was coming through our secondary controller on that device. 
And that uh, caused our switching to fail, which it was a cascade effect and it took us a little bit to find it. Once we did find it, uh, we were able to switch over temporarily to using only the secondary controller and our networks back up. It's unstable. It's unsafe to leave it running. Um, we're bound to lose data if we continue this. We have a disaster recovery center uh, that runs and it keeps our servers synced up within uh, about two hours of our live data. But you can imagine that if we were to lose two hours of payments, two hours of police reporting, uh, that would be a, a screaming disaster as far as IT is concerned. Uh, it's an expensive piece of equipment, uh, which we don't have any warranty on. Uh, we don't have any service on. Uh, it's kind of a casualty of the whole COVID mess. Um, the place that was making spare parts on that, uh, or making all the parts on it, was in China, and it shut down over COVID, and the plant never reopened. So the device is a dead device to us. Uh, it's untrustworthy. It's on the verge of total collapse. Uh, we're able to keep the city running at the moment. We've managed to make sure our backups are in good shape, our disaster recovery centers running as it should be. But this is such a big item. We had it in the 2026 CIP to replace. Um, we were gonna try when we first learned that parts were being made and we couldn't buy warranty on it anymore. Um, we were going to try to extend its life out to 2026. We don't believe it's going to make it. We want to move that uh, item from the 2026 CIP up to the 2024 CIP during the first budget amendment of 2024. But I wanted to make you aware of what was going on, what we're facing, um, and uh, exactly how serious it is to IT. Any questions? Um, Carson? Um, this is your VMware box? This is the actual SAN that all the VMware storage is, goes to. So we're running VMware hosts no, that no, have uh, no data storage in them. It's all running iSCSI out to a SAN. What are you going to replace it with? Uh, probably uh, an HP, a Nimble, or their latest line. Uh, the the one we currently are is called a uh, uh, tin tree. I looked it up. Um, okay. Any other okay. questions? No. Thank you, Council. Sounds good. Thank you so very much. Do you need any special? No, questions? just it, it was it was an emergency, um, but we need to make sure we address it in a public meeting um, and then give you guys an opportunity to ask any questions. That is the end of staff update. OK, thank you, uh, Ms. Sanchez. That brings us to council comments. Um, I'll recognize the lights. Councilor Hensley, then Councilor uh, Jan Vigil. So this is my also go to Harry, I'm not sure how this. So I know we had somebody at the last meeting who commented on the crosswalks at Adam State. And I know I saw one of them got painted and it looks really good. And so when you go through, there's another one that isn't painted. So it's kind of, you know how you have that turn. I'm not very good. So you have the turn. So there's the one at the beginning. I saw what you painted. There's another one that didn't get painted. So I was just curious because I think that one would have the same issues and it also has those little crosswalk guys on there. We're not sure it's our crosswalks, but oh. Harry can talk about them. Okay. And then I guess my next question with that is that made me start looking at a lot of crosswalks and I noticed a lot of them are getting kind of dim and just sort of how does that work to get some painted, that type of thing. All right. More time. Um, so staff has been out working on painting and getting some of them updated. Um, unfortunately it's starting to get cold so you know it's we know it's a priority i think we've taken on a little bit too much work and some of our general maintenance items have gone past us but uh, i'm not sure i i'm following on exactly on that crosswalk that you were that we were talking about we'll but we'll take a look i know ray did mention the other day he got he got that one and the crew was out crews were out painting others in the area um but not all crosswalks get painted but um and was that was, ours that so that, that crosswalk at ASU is one as a campus developed, they put it in, and that's why it had never been painted. It's not one that the city had recognized. 
I'm not trying, like I said, I'm not trying to. Oh, no. I just, it was now noticeable to have that one. I was like, oh, that is, does make a difference. And all I noticed was, okay, now the other one sort yeah. of, it shows that it doesn't have it. So, sure. and it's kind of in that real crazy turn that's there. So anyway, I just thought I'd. I think we're still really feeling the effects of being short staffed for a few years. You know, we're just, we're just behind on some general maintenance really stuff. It. I understand. Okay, Councilor Vigil and Councilor Krebs. Thank you, Mayor. Just something that I wanted to acknowledge that with all the stuff that's happened here over the last month is um, I wanted to um, bring light to the day of kindness and the folks that who painted the bridge there. I wanted to thank Katie Doxon and Bianca Maestas, as well as like Lisa Lucero and Jamie Dominguez and all their groups of people. Uh, if you haven't seen it yet, Council, the, the footbridge just right here is awesome. It's protected with a, a sealant or something like that. So just really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor uh, Vio, Councilor Cripps, and then Councilor uh, Carson. Um, I had the absolute stand there and giggle joy of being part of the um, light celebration on Friday night. And I just wanna give a huge shout out to the city staff that worked so hard to make that such a wonderful event. It, it was, it was so appreciated and um, all the way down to the green Santa trail. That was just so cute. So thank you so much for all the hard work that went into that. Okay. Thank you, uh, Councilor Cribs. Councilor Carson. Um, so uh, we, we, we appreciate our staff and, and we appreciate the city, um, you know, and I'm not speaking for all the council, but, but I'm, I'm going to at this moment or speak to council. Um, this is the fifth night, I think, fifth Wednesday that we're here till near 10 or after 10 o'clock. Um, we've had a lot of stuff go on in the last couple months. Uh, and I just want to thank council because I, you know, I, I know that, there's, there's a lot of uh, back and forth positive and, and people say a lot of positive things. We, we, you know, Charlie retired tonight, Christina retired tonight, but it's been mentioned, you know, about us running unopposed and things like that. Um, this is a grueling job. We all have full-time jobs. We all have a life outside of here. And so I just want to thank council, thank all you guys for, for, for the grinding, for being here and, and for working through it and, and walking out of this room and not hitting each other afterwards, because again, it's tough. Um, but you know, we, we, we've been here late a lot and we're here late a lot all the time. Uh, but I just want to thank council. I think, you know, I'm not patting us on the back. What I'm saying is that this is a rough gig. We don't, you know, city count, city staff's great. You guys kick butt. We have a good city staff, but you guys get paid. We really don't get paid for this stuff. And, and the minimal, we do it because we love our community. That's basically what I'm trying to say. And um, as rough as things get, I know that I'm pretty resilient and I feel like I've had my butt kicked lately. And so I know everybody else does. So thank you guys, because it is it is a grueling gig. So I just want to tell you guys, thank you. Thank, thank you, Councilor Carson. Um, Councilor Jackie Vigil, then Councilor Jan Vigil. Um, I just wanted to say thank you for including me on in all the executive sessions, although they were grueling. <laughs> um, that was an experience for me, and I learned a lot in those sessions. And um, just thank everybody for including me, even though they were tough. But I learned a lot about our city and employees and everything. So. Thank you, uh, Councillor Jackie V. Hill. Councillor Young V. Hill. I just wanted a quick uh, welcome, Jackie, to the team. Uh, and for everybody, so there's no issues. Me and Jackie are not related at all. <laughs> uh, we V. Hills just run deep. That's all. Okay. All right. I don't see any other lights so on, so I'll just wrap things up. I want to thank uh, the Parks and Rec crew uh, for all the decorations and the lights around the city. Did a marvelous job, and thanks for the um, celebration.
first Friday crew. I think that was pretty cool. All the music that was going on at the different venues, uh, the walk uh, down Main Street. And I was told that a lot of the businesses decorated the trees that were in front of their uh, location. So it looks like it was a, a collaborative effort on behalf of the community who really enjoys seeing uh, the, the progress that we're, we're having in downtown Alamosa. And then I want to congratulate uh, all of the candidates who got sworn in tonight. Uh, congratulations to you all. Some of you are new, um, like uh, Councillor Jackie B. Hill, and then some of you are returning. And I just want to thank you all for uh, wanting to come back. So I wish <laughs> <laughs> I want to wish you all the all the best. And um, with that being said, no more lights on. This meeting is adjourned. Thank you.